Okay, I guess we can start. Hey everyone, uh, good day. Uh, great uh, to see you all virtually. Uh, my name is uh, Roy and uh, today we'll talk about uh, uh, template libraries in uh, C++. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so uh, as I you probably already seen. My name is Roy, Roy Barkan. I live in Israel, in Tel Aviv. It's currently 8.30 in the evening here. Really excited to see you all. I've been writing C++ and reading it since the year 2000. I currently work for Easter Research. We're a finance and low latency trading company located in Israel. If you are in Israel and interested in low latency and cool C++, feel free to reach out. Um, this is my first time at this conference. I've been really enjoying it so far. I've enjoyed the YouTube videos uh, of uh, previous uh, sessions and I really like them all. And uh, as you might have seen me already, I try to be active in the chat and ask uh, questions and I really encourage you to uh, uh, be active in the chat as well. Ask me questions. I want to make this as uh, uh, interactive as possible and try to uh, um, you know, be as, as helpful as I can uh, with whatever I you know, convey. So let's uh, get started. So um, uh, C20 is here. You've uh, seen uh, many concepts related talks uh, uh, in this conference uh, alone. Um, concepts are uh, really uh, cool and really uh, new, but actually they're not uh, so new. They've been with us for a long time. And just uh, to get a little bit of a glimpse of uh, what they are, let's uh, hear a little bit uh, about concepts back uh, in time from early 2014. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of uh, concepts that we've used in all of our code, and these are all defines to type name. Right? It's just documentation today. Maybe at some point there will be a way in the language to express this, but but today that's the way it is. Okay, so as you can see, in 2014 there weren't really language concepts in the language, but people who wrote libraries actually just they had the concepts.h file with a bunch of defines using uh, names of uh, various concepts, uh, converting into type name. The compiler really didn't know what to do with it, didn't really help us, but uh, those who wrote the uh, template libraries were thinking with concepts and it helped them uh, write their code, reason about their code, and uh, it's good to see that uh, it was there all the way. Uh, the people uh, in this uh, uh, video, if you don't know, are uh, Alexander Stepanov and uh, his, his fellows on the A9. Alexander Ste uh, yeah, Stepanov is uh, uh, the author of the, the STL library, and uh, we have obviously a lot to thank him. And uh, uh, if we try to even go uh, further back in time to 2013, to the same class, we uh, can see a little bit uh, from... Uh, uh, guest uh, lecturer, uh, Bjarne the you know, in inventor of C++. Let's see what he has to say about concepts. Um, concepts are fundamental. They're, they're meant to have uh, represent uh, fundamental concept in the application area. Uh, Alex has been saying this for at least 15 years, but most people haven't gotten it. Okay, so concepts are fundamental if we are to listen to uh, Strasstrup. Uh, people haven't gotten it then, but uh, obviously now with it in the language, people are starting to get it. And uh, in this talk, we'll try to understand what's uh, so fundamental about them and how uh, it will help us when we write our own code. So and the, basically, the thing uh, has a lot to do with templates and the overload resolution. Okay, so uh, templates, as we all know, uh, is a way to write a single piece of code uh, to implement an algorithm across many, many different uh, types. Um, here's an example, a very simple uh, algorithm uh, called min, which uh, looks for the minimum uh, of uh, two uh, objects. It's templated on T, and uh, we can easily see that uh, uh, we write it, everyone knows it, very, very simple. And uh, uh, template uh, metaprogramming is a trick that allows us to uh, do things a little more uh, uh, tricky, uh, like in this example with uh, the swap algorithm, uh, where if you want to uh, implement or do the same uh, semantics, the same uh, algorithms for a single object or for an array of objects, we need to write different code. So the same operation needs different code. Um, and here we can see uh, that uh, it was possible even in C++ 98, we just write uh, the two uh, overloads with different uh, uh, template arguments. And uh, the compiler basically knows how to choose the correct code to implement the same algorithm across different types. And this is really uh, great and cool. Uh, sometimes even in C++ 98, uh, we also uh, had cases where the same code could be used across uh, many types, but uh, 
uh, we prefer a different uh, code for different cases to get uh, maybe better performance or better characteristics. So this uh, example is look, looks a little bit uh, convoluted, but basically it uh, shows us a small trick called the enable if. Um, the trick is also called uh, sometimes a sfine. Um, and in this case, you can see an, an implementation of the fill algorithm that uh, just fills uh, a sequence of, uh, uh, of, of elements uh, with the same uh, item one after another. And then uh, we use the enable if uh, trick to write a, a specific implementation in case uh, we want to fill an array of uh, characters. Okay? And in this case, if we know that we have a, a byte uh, array, we can just go and uh, perform a mem set. Okay? So, the same code uh, uh, of the original algorithm could have worked, but we uh, use metaprogramming tricks to get a better uh, behavior, better uh, runtime uh, characteristics in, in this case. Okay, uh, you know, one might say that uh, um, a good compiler could get uh, uh, the, uh, the, the same performance without this uh, uh, trick, but uh, here the SDL implementer decided to force the hand of the compiler and, and tell the compiler, hey, in this case, I want to do a mem set, don't try to uh, do anything else. Okay, so uh, after this uh, short introduction about uh, uh, what the templates are and what the uh, uh, template metaprogramming is, I'll try to uh, frame uh, our uh, discussion and our talk for today, uh, where I basically try to uh, uh, talk about how we put constraints on our template. Uh, we'll use the, the C++ 20 concepts as a framework for discussion to uh, uh, see what we might want to think about when we write our uh, template uh, libraries or template code and uh, uh, look at various, uh, I guess, various uh, uh, processes versus uh, tricks versus ways um, to, uh, uh, to write our uh, code uh, more uh, more template friendly and more user friendly uh, with concepts and without them. I will uh, share a lot of opinions, some facts. Uh, feel free to criticize me, uh, to again ask questions. I don't know everything, I'll be happy to learn. Uh, I'll try to give uh, some uh, tips from uh, my experience and from what I've seen uh, in the past. I'll also give a few suggestions on where I think uh, the language itself uh, might be uh, less than optimal and uh, where I think uh, things can be improved. Again, it's just their opinions. I'll, I've peppered this uh, talk with uh, code snippets, mainly from the STL. And uh, as you've already seen, uh, clips from YouTube to try and make things uh, more interesting. In the slides themselves, you can see links to the full uh, YouTube uh, lectures. So you can go and uh, uh, look at the full uh, information. I recommend it if you like. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dive in and uh, learn what the concepts are just to give us uh, an overview of why, what we want in a good uh, template library. So back to uh, 2013, back to Strasstrup. Let's hear what he has to say. And the thing we were working on is it becomes a bunch of constant expressions. It becomes a bunch of Boolean expressions. Does this type have this property? Does the argument type has this property? Has the combination of types we get as arguments got this property. It's all predicates, it's all Boolean algebra. Okay, so we heard it from uh, Strasrup. Concepts are just a bunch of Boolean expression, all predicates, Boolean algebra. The, the main thing about concepts or the, the core thing is Boolean algebra and predicates. What else? Now that we know what they are, what are they uh, used for? What are they good for? Okay, obviously they're good for many things, but um, from my perspective, this is uh, the core of the matter. Let's hear Bjarne. You can overload if it meets the sets of constraints from one and not the other. That's the story. If it meets, if they are subsets of each other, then it'll take the one you, uh, the, the biggest one it can. In, in, in other words, if you, most specific. Most specific. Well, the one that, has, that, that meets the, the largest number of the predicates. Okay, so concepts are used for overloading and for choosing uh, uh, between different implementations of the same uh, function of the same algorithm. Okay, as we talked uh, and, and seen before, uh, we let uh, a library writer uh, put different types of code uh, to implement the same algorithm and the compiler lets you choose and uh, based on whoever uh, implementation meets the largest number of, uh, of predicates. And we'll see um, 
more details about that later on. So let's uh, leave uh, Bjarne alone for now and uh, tell you a third thing about uh, concepts, which I think is very important. Um, based on the, the initial introduction to the concepts library from cppreference.com. Uh, this is a long paragraph, I won't read it all. I just want to highlight uh, one important thing, which has to do with uh, uh, syntax versus semantics. Okay, you probably heard of that uh, before in the past, and I just want to highlight it, that uh, a concept in the, the, the library, in every, every library, is uh, uh, talking about the syntax requirements, but also about semantics. Okay, and if the semantic requirements are not met at the point of use, the program is informed, no diagnostics requirement. That's what we sometimes refer to as uh, undefined behavior. The code will compile, but there's no, there are no guarantees on uh, uh, how it will uh, uh, actually work in, in, when we run it. So it's uh, important to remember uh, the semantics because if we don't, we can get uh, undefined behavior. Okay, so that's uh, basically it. Concepts are a bunch of Boolean expressions. Uh, we use them for overloading and we take the overload that meets the lar largest number of predicates. And uh, whenever we think of concepts, whenever we work with concepts, we need to keep in mind the syntax and, and also the semantics of each concept. And that is basically the outline of uh, uh, my talk today. And we'll go over uh, each of these three bullets and try to uh, talk a little more about them, reason about them, try to see what they mean and how they, we can leverage them. Um, this could be a good uh, time to uh, ask uh, to see if anyone has any questions or comments. I'm trying to uh, uh, monitor the chat room as well as the q and I don't see any uh, comments or questions in the Q&A, so I'll just uh, proceed. But please feel free to uh, ask questions, uh, write your comments. I'll be happy to answer them and we'll have um, some stops in, in the middle of the talk uh, to uh, try and address those questions. Okay, so a bunch of Boolean expressions. What, how do we write uh, Boolean expressions with concepts? So the, the basic uh, way is to just uh, uh, define a, a concept and just uh, have it uh, be equal to some Boolean, okay? Easy integral V is a Boolean. Uh, we've had it uh, uh, in some form of one or another uh, since uh, C++ 98, the, those are type traits. Uh, specifically, easy integral V is uh, something, the underscore V uh, suffix was added a little later on. But uh, if I have a Boolean, I can create a concept out of the Boolean. That's the simplest way. Um, we can go even uh, deeper and use uh, Boolean expressions, just like Bjarne said. Uh, so a sign integral is a Boolean expression over two other uh, uh, Booleans. Okay, we can see that we use the STD integral concept um, as, as a part of uh, this uh, new one and uh, another type trait uh, to complete it. Okay, so Boolean expressions, relatively easy. And the third uh, way to uh, create a concept is by using what we call a requires expression. Okay, this is a new thing in C20, a really cool thing. We can basically write uh, sort of like a, a recipe of uh, what the uh, types need to, uh, uh, to, to meet in terms of uh, syntax, okay? Whatever we write inside the requires expression needs to be uh, legal code that can compile, okay? You can also write uh, uh, various constraints on the return types of uh, those expressions, etc. You've seen uh, many talks about the uh, intricate details about them, uh, but and still, basically, each requires expression uh, contains some code. The code uh, never gets uh, actually executed or run. The compiler just checks if it's legal code. And if it is, uh, uh, the Boolean is true. We can put it inside the concept. We can put requires expressions, by the way, not just when we are defining concepts, we can put requires expressions wherever we like in, uh, in, the, in our code base as of C20. But uh, one of the main motivations for this uh, new uh, type of expression is to be uh, for, for defining uh, concepts more uh, easily and more uh, clearly. Okay, so uh, these are the ba basic ways of how do we uh, define uh, Boolean expressions for concepts. Okay, before uh, C plus twenty, we had uh, Boolean expressions on on types um, uh, with many many different uh, ways. Uh, that we used, okay? One of them I've already talked about is type traits, okay? So type traits had them uh, from day one, basically. And with a type trait, I can uh, basically, uh, you know, define uh, some uh, object and say that uh, it can be e equal to true, or I can say that it's equal to true um, in case, uh, uh, either in every case, or I can use, uh, some other mechanisms to uh, choose when it's true and when it's false. Uh, variable templates are also uh, something that was added, I think, in CPP 14. Um, and uh, basically, 
very, very similar. Just define a Boolean, template it on some types, and it can be either true or false. And uh, const expert function templates are also uh, part of the uh, vocabulary, part of the uh, menu of options and ways for us to create uh, uh, Booleans for types. Is pointer inter convertible with class is a relatively recent uh, addition to STL. I don't, I don't really care about its exact uh, meaning right now, but we can just see that it's a way to create a Boolean out of uh, types, and it's a, a predicate that's uh, known at compile time. Okay, so it's, it's not really new, and uh, uh, we can uh, go and uh, use these uh, very, very similarly to the way that we do uh, concepts. We can I uh, use uh, Boolean expressions. Okay, so is scalar is a type trait that is uh, defined as a Boolean expression uh, around the uh, arithmetic and enum and the uh, pointer, member to pointer, etc. So Boolean expressions, just like uh, they're allowed for concepts, they're allowed uh, uh, here for type traits and obviously the other uh, types of predicates. And uh, uh, Sphine is uh, um, a mechanism uh, that is also used to uh, and mimic uh, the, the, the requires expression uh, functionality, okay, that we actually had before uh, C20, even uh, as, as, as far back as C98, you could do things similar to uh, this uh, uh, void T uh, detection idiom uh, that uh, we see here, okay? So in this example, again, it looks a little bit convoluted, and uh, uh, one of the main uh, strong points of C++ concepts is, and requires expressions. It ma makes uh, these types of convoluted code unnecessary. You can just write things more clearly. And uh, th in this uh, way, or this uh, piece of code, basically tries to mimic uh, or find objects that have uh, a method called meow. Okay, so uh, we define has meow generally as false. And then we uh, perform uh, some uh, specialization in case uh, an object uh, has uh, a meow method. In this case, it becomes true. And this is uh, the old way to do uh, requires expressions from before to plus 20. Okay, so basically almost everything that we can do with concepts, we could have done uh, uh, before with maybe just a little different uh, syntax, a diff little different way of writing it. But there are also things that are not really possible with concepts uh, that are still uh, possible and uh, uh, can be done uh, uh, in, in for other uh, types of predicates, uh, one such thing is uh, specialization, okay? So uh, the way that the, the is const uh, uh, type trait is defined is using a specialization. And we can see that is const again is false, but uh, we can specialize it for const objects and turn it into true. Um, we can do a uh, specialization, not just for uh, defining uh, groups of uh, types, but also for a, uh, uh, things like opt-in or opt-out, okay? So uh, enabled borrowed range is uh, a constant expression Boolean in the STL since uh, C plus 20. The STL defines it as false, uh, categorically false seemingly, but uh, it is a way to let uh, whoever uses the STL uh, opt out of certain uh, uh, features or opt into them, okay? So whoever wants uh, or has a range and they think it's a borrowed range, they can basically specialize uh, enabled borrowed range for their own type set it to true, and this way they can uh, opt in to some uh, functionality or opt out of it. Um, these are, this is an, a, you know, a common way to let uh, the users of a library uh, choose which uh, functionality they want in the library. And these uh, two things are basically specializations, and it's interesting to know that concepts cannot be specialized, okay? So basically, I, as far as I remember, every uh, type of template except for concepts can be specialized in C++. And uh, uh, the only thing uh, that I know that is templated and cannot be specialized is concepts, okay? Um, this isn't really uh, much of a hurdle, or isn't really much of a pain, because if I like, I can define a concept as equal to some uh, other uh, type of predicate and go and uh, specialize that uh, predicate. So I can have my concept be equal to a constant Boolean, for example, and if someone specializes that, then effectively it's as if they specialize the concept. Okay, so uh, this is uh, one way uh, uh, that is not was not possible or is not possible for concepts, but and still people uh, use it. Another uh, approach for defining uh, predicate on types, which is very very similar but still uh, worth mentioning, is uh, by uh, using other types of uh, traits, not just type traits, but just traits uh, objects. So in this example, uh, numeric limits is a, a 
some trait uh, object that uh, exists in the STL. And uh, anyone who wants can uh, uh, go and uh, specialize numeric limits for their own uh, uh, class. Okay, so if I write a temperature class, I can go and uh, specialize uh, numeric limits for that uh, class. I have to, uh, when I go and specialize, I need to go and uh, set uh, various uh, members of that uh, traits class. Some of them can be Boolean, uh, as we can see here. Right, so this is another way to uh, create or to put predicates on types and the ways that in a way that the library is you know created for its users uh, to basically guide it on how to work with uh, the application classes. Okay, so this is basically uh, a short premiere of a bunch of uh, Boolean expressions of writing predicates on types. Um, this is a, a nice uh, first uh, section. Uh, I don't see any questions or comments in the chat. So I guess we can continue uh, to talk about uh, overloads and uh, choosing the overloads that meets, uh, that meets uh, a, a large number of predicates. So um, the basic idea is to control uh, the interaction between a library and the application. Okay, so basically, Whenever we write uh, some template code, I think of uh, myself as writing a library, okay, that is templated. It can work with any number of, uh, of objects that are created by my library user. The library user is an application. The application implements a class, and they use that class with my library in a templated way. And uh, whenever we have uh, different components developed by different people on separate occasions, there's a risk of, uh, uh, of problems. There's a risk of uh, incorrect uh, uh, assumptions. And if there are incorrect assumptions, it can lead uh, to, to bugs, to problems. If the bugs uh, are caught at compile time, it be, it's great. Sometimes uh, the code uh, compiles and we get uh, bugs uh, in runtime, it's even worse. And uh, uh, to a large extent, the uh, way to control which uh, application classes can be used with uh, uh, a library and, and how is, uh, um, is meant in order to avoid those misunderstandings, avoid those uh, assumptions and expectations. Okay, so overload resolution is basically the way uh, for the C++ language to let, uh, uh, to choose which uh, uh, functions can be called with which uh, uh, types and then and hopefully uh, disallow uh, improper usage, okay? Um, yeah, I see that uh, uh, Phil has just asked uh, which GCC version I recommend uh, to use with uh, concepts. And uh, I really can, can't say much about it. I think uh, um, I, th I think the, I usually uh, use the trunk uh, when I write uh, my concepts code, but that's uh, not really uh, production grade. Uh, unfortunately, our, our uh, production systems are not the C++20 yet, but uh, I would uh, definitely uh, uh, go and look at the, some other concepts talk, uh, even from this conference, they talk a lot about that. Okay. Um, and I see that uh, Joe uh, recommends GCC 10.2. Um, okay. So uh, if I want to, uh, whenever I uh, use uh, overloads and, and mechanisms uh, in order to, uh, you know, try to, to define and to help me uh, express the expectations of a library from application uh, code. I, it can either be as simple as just an on-off constraint, say, hey, I do not want this part of the library to be used with these types of uh, application classes. Or it can be more advanced where I have uh, sort of like several algorithms or several uh, implementations, and uh, I want to convey which uh, of the several implementations uh, work best with different uh, application classes. Okay, we've seen examples of that uh, before, like with the swap algorithm. Okay, um, and uh, there are uh, resolution uh, mechanisms or ways uh, uh, for a library to uh, basically present what it expects from an application that are really, really harsh and hard and they cannot be bypassed. And others uh, are meant to be easily bypassed. So if uh, um, someone has an application class, which uh, for some reason uh, the library decided it does not want uh, uh, to, uh, to to work with with, with its uh, specific algorithms or, or objects, uh, some, there are ways uh, for the library to really uh, uh, prohibit such uses. And there are other ways and mechanisms which allow uh, sort of like escape patches or allows the application to uh, basically 
uh, bypass it and, and do whatever they want. Okay, it's simple as it's quite common. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as uh, foot guns to uh, let uh, an application uh, have a way to try and uh, you know step out of the realm of what the library implementer intended if they really think they know what they're doing. But obviously, we would like uh, some defaults that uh, prohibit that or that at least uh, uh, warn uh, people not to do what isn't uh, uh, meant uh, to be. And uh, we'll see a, a few examples in the next few slides. Okay, so uh, concepts is the, I get the first uh, way for a library that I want to talk to, to you about, for a library to um, describe what it expects from the application. Um, as we, uh, you probably might have seen in other talks, the main way to do it is using what's called a requires clause. Okay, a requires clause is different from a requires expression. Okay, and requires clause is something that I basically put to annotate on my uh, on my functions, sometimes on my classes, and uh, basically uh, to restrict those functions only to specific cases. Okay, there are some other uh, syntax alternatives that can be used to uh, attach constraints to functions. Uh, for concepts, you can look at other talks uh, for specifically how that uh, works. And uh, if there are several uh, uh, functions with the same name, several overloads that have different uh, requires clauses, and uh, an application wants to use um, my a function uh, with its own class, and several of the uh, implementations basically meet the, the constraints, then the compiler tries to find the best uh, version. Okay, it finds, tries to find uh, the one that is most, most specialized. As uh, Bjarn uh, said, it's uh, the rules here are uh, quite uh, delicate. Okay, it's, it has to do um, with trying to uh, to find a, a subset or subsumptions of one concept versus versus the other, or one constraint versus the other. Um, that if anyone uh, remembers or knows uh, uh, from like computer science, the terms uh, of uh, conjunctive normal form, and disjunctive normal form, this is uh, part of the uh, mechanism or the algorithm that the compiler itself does to try and choose uh, between different uh, alternatives, which is the most uh, specialized or which uh, concept might subsume the other. And uh, basically, if you write our uh, uh, functions and our uh, requires clauses correctly, we can uh, really assist uh, the compiler uh, with choosing the correct uh, implementations uh, to use. Okay, uh, requires clauses uh, and, and concepts are what's called the uh, Sphene friendly. Okay, Sphene, uh, for those who uh, might not uh, remember right now, is a really strange acronym for that said that substitution failure is not an error. And it basically means that if, uh, uh, you know, the code inside the requires clause um, doesn't, isn't a, a Really uh, doesn't really compile. Isn't a valid uh, C plus plus. Usually, it does it doesn't cause the compiler error. It basically just uh, causes that specific uh, uh, function, that specific constraint, to be converted into false, to be just uh, discarded, and the compiler will just look for other alternatives. Okay? If there are, if after uh, looking at all the alternatives, none of them uh, works, then we'll see a compiler error. But uh, in general. Uh, a specific uh, failure uh, will not cause the uh, compilation to fail. Um, the error messages for uh, uh, concepts and for uh, trying to run a, a function that isn't uh, doesn't meet its requirements are much clearer than other alternatives. That's a, a big uh, selling point, a big win for concepts compared to uh, other mechanisms that we'll see uh, uh, later on. Compilation speeds are relatively fast compared to other mechanisms that we'll see uh, later on, which is another big win. And the, the basic idea, as I, uh, I mentioned, is the library writer basically thinks of concepts, thinks of requirements, attaches the requirements to the, to the library functions themselves. And uh, the application that uses the library must conform. Okay, The application classes uh, that want to use the library, they need to conform to the specific uh, uh, requirements that are defined in the concepts, that are defined in the requires clauses. If uh, uh, the application class does not conform, there is no uh, uh, way to bypass it. There is no way to uh, tell the uh, the compiler to just uh, try, just uh, try to uh, uh, choose uh, one of the alternatives and uh, let's see if it uh, it works. It's very very strict in that manner. Okay, so this is the uh, the first cleanest mechanism, the newest mechanism, which uh, you, it would be uh, important or nice for you to know. Um, <clears throat> there are obviously other alternatives that uh, we've used. Before C plus twenty, uh, the most uh, uh, advanced one before C plus twenty, we've already seen it before. It's called the uh, enable if uh, or Sphene. 
it is a little tricky. Let's uh, go and uh, listen to a few uh, um, sentences or descriptions from uh, Timur Dumler in his talk uh, from uh, CPPCon just a few months ago, where he'll tell us uh, his take on how we used to work before uh, concepts were introduced. Let's remember if we, um, let's see if we can remember how to um, how to use the enable if. Okay, so you can write the std enable if uh, integral type and floating point type. Where do we put this? This is something that I can I can never remember, right? So you can put this onto the return type of the function, but then you don't really see the actual return type anymore, so that's not great. You can put this into the parameter list, but then you don't really see the parameter list anymore. So I don't like either of these. Um, so my favorite method is actually to put this into the template argument list, because then you can still cleanly see the function signature. Um, so that's, I think, the most readable way of doing this, except it doesn't work. Um, because it turns out that uh, in C++, defaulted uh, template arguments are not part of the function signature. And then you again have the same function signature twice, and then you again get this error redefinition of function template. Turns out you can work around that because that rule doesn't apply to non-type template parameters, so you can make this an int uh, template parameter. Okay, so that was Timur about the, the old way to do uh, concepts, which is enable if. As you can see, we won't uh, dive too deeply into it, but it's complicated, okay? There are many ways. It's hard to remember exactly how to do it correctly. Uh, you write code that looks like it's fine, but then in some cases it, it doesn't really work. Really, really convoluted. That was uh, the best that we had before concepts. Uh, still, if you want, you can, you can use it. There might be uh, cases where you want to use it. Just uh, remember that it's complicated and you can go and uh, look at uh, various uh, uh, talks from before 0 plus 20 to see how it's done. And um, it's uh, generally a library guided approach. Um, as, uh, uh, as we've seen, the library defines its requirements by using these enable if statements. Okay, this is very similar to concepts. Um, but uh, in this case, the compiler doesn't do any ranking. Okay, the compiler basically just wants to look to see which of the overloads matches the uh, requirements and which doesn't. And in case there are multiple matches, the compiler doesn't rack, it just causes a compilation error, okay? which is obviously uh, less, uh, less uh, um, positive than, uh, than what the concepts give us. Um, and uh, th th but that's the way it is. Uh, another mechanism which is library guided is uh, what I sometimes call partial specialization, but in fact, uh, uh, the correct name for it is just a function overloading with where one function or one overload is more specialized than the other. Okay, in this case, we can see just an example from uh, uh, STL actually, the same function uh, to address um, is templated uh, on a type. In one case, it's uh, it, it, it uh, tries to use the type as a const reference. In the other case, it uses it as a pointer. And the rules say that uh, using it as a pointer is more specialized. And for that reason, um, yeah, whenever we try to call to address with a pointer, we'll get the second uh, uh, implementation. And uh, on every other case, we'll get uh, the first implementation. Okay, we've also seen the similar thing with uh, the swap algorithm earlier on. Okay, so this was, is a way that is different than uh, uh, the other ways uh, that we had in order to try to uh, choose different implementations uh, and, uh, and get the best one, let, let the compiler choose the best one, okay? Here there are also rules. Again, the library chooses which types of templates it has. Uh, the rules basically uh, dictate uh, you know, how, what is allowed and what is not allowed, what the compiler uh, uh, chooses uh, in, like in front of, uh, of anything else. But if uh, uh, what your library wants is basically to uh, distinguish between uh, constants and non-constants, between pointers and references, um, and these types of things, uh, then uh, this uh, mechanism can be very, very useful, and it's nice to know about it. Uh, and again, there is a very little control for the application. Okay? If uh, uh, the application has a pointer and for some reason wants to uh, use uh, uh, the other implementation that was not meant for a pointer, but meant for a reference object, there's no uh, real way uh, uh, to do it, okay? Um, so that's uh, basically what I said. The library defines the requirements and the compiler here does know how to rank and find the most specialized one based on its rules. Okay, another mechanism 
uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, important to know about, is uh, called the tag dispatch. Okay, tag dispatch is uh, uh, the classic way in which uh, STL itself chooses uh, among different uh, algorithms, among different implementations, when it decides how to work uh, with uh, different templates, with different uh, uh, objects. Okay, the basic idea here is that uh, uh, I have uh, uh, some traits uh, classes, and the traits are uh, separated into se several categories. Okay, and uh, uh, my uh, uh, functions can uh, act, can receive an extra argument, uh, which is of the of the type of the category that you want. Okay, in this case, uh, the advanced algorithm in the STL, it uh, can be templated on any input iterator. Uh, but then uh, all it does is just pass along the uh, you know the uh, the processing into an internal algorithm called underscore underscore advanced which has an extra argument. That argument has a type of, uh, of the iterator category, the category of that iterator that we're templated on, okay? The STL defines, uh, I think, five uh, different categories for iterators, and uh, uh, it also uh, implements uh, up to five different underscore underscore advanced uh, functions. And that way, um, the compiler knows which uh, underscore underscore advanced to call based on the iterator that it was given, okay? In the STL, uh, the categories are things like uh, input iterator, forward iterator, bidirectional iterator, random access iterator, et cetera. And uh, in the advanced case, for example, we know that uh, uh, random access iterator uh, can be uh, advanced by n steps by just calling uh, the plus equals operator, just moving it n steps in one, uh, in one uh, uh, a quick operation. However, if I have something like a forward iterator, I need to just uh, perform plus plus n times, just loop around it and take one step at a time for n times in order to advance it. Okay. In the STL itself, we can see that uh, this uh, tag dispatch is done inside some hidden underscore underscore uh, uh, implementation. Okay. The caller that uh, calls advance, they cannot actually pass the category by themselves. Okay, they have to, uh, they, they just pass in their own iterators and inside the STL, uh, we, the library goes in and chooses uh, the correct category for the uh, iterator that was passed in. And technically, this is not a uh, mandatory, this is not a must. This is the way that STL did it, but if you write your own library, you can expose that third argument to your uh, uh, users as well. You can add this third argument as a, uh, into the external function that you like, give it the default argument or default value, uh, that is the iterator category of that iterator that uh, was received as the first argument. And this will allow uh, whoever uses your library to get a good default, okay? Uh, let the compiler choose the good default, which is the iter iterator category, but also to uh, go and override it if they think that they know something that uh, uh, you do not, okay? So if for some reason, a uh, specific application knows that uh, it wants to advance by uh, a random access iterator by stepping in uh, one, uh, you know, one step at a time, uh, potentially it, it could have been done if the library chose to expose this uh, category as another uh, argument, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little tricky, but it can be done. Um, Okay, so that's a tag dispatch. Um, and this uh, concludes uh, different uh, ways uh, for a library uh, to uh, impose uh, uh, guidelines on the application. There are some other ways in which uh, uh, the application is more uh, in charge and more in control. Um, so uh, uh, one of them is called uh, uh, a policy-based design. Okay, that's a, a term that I believe was coined by uh, uh, Andre Alexandrescu. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, I can take uh, in my uh, library some uh, core functionality uh, of my algorithm and expose it to the application by uh, making my code uh, templated on some, uh, uh, on some object that the uh, application can uh, implement and put in its own code inside it, okay? So max element is a good example from uh, uh, STL where uh, we can uh, let the application choose how to compare two elements, okay? So, and then if the application knows how to compare two elements, we can just uh, uh, go and, uh, yeah, we can, we can go and uh, find the maximum one uh, from a, a sequence of uh, uh, four iterators. Um, and there's also a good default, okay? So if the uh, 
application doesn't really want to think about it, then they can use the default and things will usually work. Okay, this is a, uh, another nice way to control uh, how, we, uh, how we basically choose uh, uh, the, the, the library implementation and, and let the application interact with our code. This is a very powerful technique. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that the, uh, it lets you uh, your code run the same uh, max element algorithm in different places of your code with the exact same iterator type, but with different comparators. Okay, it's, we don't have to uh, bind uh, the uh, implementation of a specific uh, algorithm with a specific application class. We can have different calls with different uh, policies uh, within it, which is uh, uh, pretty cool. And uh, it's one of the best ways to do it. Uh, Policy-based design, I think is uh, quite common, is, is very, very strong uh, for function uh, libraries or, or algorithms. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, library data structures and objects, it sometimes gets a, a worse reputation or bad reputation. And uh, a good example of that or a canonical example of that is the, the allocator uh, of, uh, of most uh, STL containers, okay? Most STL containers are uh, templated on, on the allocator type, okay? And it uh, um, makes it, it is a policy that helps uh, someone choose where they want to allocate and how they want to allocate the members of a data structure. It's very, very powerful, but it makes things a little bit uh, uh, tricky when it comes to interoperability. It's hard to uh, reason about uh, how to, um, uh, for example, uh, move or copy items from one data structure to another data structure in case they uh, maybe uh, have different allocators. Uh, it's sometimes hard to reason about that, uh, especially if you want to talk about uh, move operations where I would maybe want to keep elements and avoid copies. What do we do about that? It's, it's a little bit tricky uh, for that reason. Uh, uh, C++ also uh, you know, added the functionality of not just the, the, the old allocators, but also added the polymorphic allocators called PMR. Um, but in general, the, the idea of policy-based design is usually uh, quite good in case you want uh, to let the application control some piece or some core piece of the code that you're working with. Another mechanism that is uh, application guided is what's called the uh, customization points. Okay, and uh, later on, uh, we also heard about the uh, customization point objects and the uh, tag invoke. I'll uh, talk a little bit uh, about them. Generally, the uh, thing about uh, customization points is uh, again some algorithms that the library wants to use, and uh, sometimes, usually, it would have a, a good default, but uh, I can let uh, uh, the application. Uh, specialize them, okay? We'll let the application uh, give, do it uh, a little differently or decide how it actually wants to be done. Okay, unlike policy-based design, customization points cannot be uh, you know, changed or overridden on different call sites. These are a tight binding between the algorithm that I want to customize and the uh, application object that you want to uh, optimize it for. But basically, uh, it's very, very strong and it doesn't suffer from uh, uh, you know, the different... Uh, uh, I guess complexities that the policy-based design might have, for example, with allocators, et cetera. Um, STD swap, ranges size, ranges empty are some uh, examples of uh, customization points. Okay, so those are, as, as I mentioned, those are uh, functions usually that are uh, defined inside my library. And uh, I know that and, and let uh, the application basically uh, override it in some uh, way or another in order to, uh, to get a specific behavior that they might want, uh, in order to uh, best know how to swap or get the size uh, or check whether a range is empty for their own uh, specific object that the application has. Uh, okay, and I see in the chat that, uh, yeah, Bernard said that the Boost concept uh, uh, also existed before S plus 20, that's right. I'm not a, a big expert on that, so, but I, if you like, you can go and look at it. It's especially maybe if you want to use concepts and uh, you're not at C20 yet. Okay, customization point objects, I want to uh, touch a little bit uh, about uh, what they are and what's the difference between, uh, I guess, uh, older style customization points and CPOs. Uh, there are many uh, talks uh, and papers about the specific intricacies in here, but basically the thing is that uh, uh, customization points are hard uh, to, to do, hard, to, hard for libraries to do correctly. Um, 
because many times they rely on the overload resolution uh, uh, mechanisms of the compiler itself. Uh, if I put, uh, uh, for example, uh, a customization point swap inside namespace STD, then anyone who wants to override uh, STD swap, they need to basically open namespace STD and uh, write their own uh, implementation inside name, namespace uh, STD, which is tricky. There are various uh, different uh, uh, mechanisms and idioms on how to correctly call uh, those customization points. You need to use uh, to perform using namespace. Uh, you need to really think uh, about uh, the exact uh, overload resolution uh, uh, process and mechanism in order to make sure that the compiler will really choose the correct customization points in correct uh, uh, places where you want it. And uh, uh, for that reason, uh, customization point objects were, were created. Uh, basically, um, overall resolution is, uh, is a tricky uh, uh, mechanism, and sometimes it works very good, but sometimes it works uh, uh, in less uh, preferable ways. And, uh, but the object uh, resolution is much uh, simpler. If I have an object called the uh, uh, STD, column images, column, column S size, there's just one object with that name. There's no way resolution to be done. And uh, if, if that object has uh, an operator parens, parens then this is exactly what uh, um, what will be called. And this and inside that object, uh, the library implementer can basically uh, implement or choose the exact overload uh, mechanism that, that, it, that it wants to use. Okay, so inside um, these uh, operator uh, paren paren of a customization point object, you will usually see things like uh, uh, if const expert, things like uh, looking for uh, using uh, uh, requires uh, expressions or uh, enable if mechanisms in order to try and uh, choose the exact uh, overload uh, that uh, uh, the application might have uh, implemented, but it can, it can be done in whichever order the, uh, the library implementer chose uh, in, instead of just relying on C++ uh, general overload resolution mechanisms. Okay, so it's pretty common, for example, for a customization of point object for maybe a size to first try to look uh, for a method inside the application class that is called S size. And if it exists, then this will be what will be called. If the uh, application class doesn't have such a method, if we look to see if there's maybe a global function called S size that can accept that application class. And if that exists, maybe this will be used. And there's you could, and the, the operator parent parent can basically go and uh, implement uh, some basic uh, you know mechanism or, or or recipe for how to best look for uh, the way that uh, the application might want me uh, to perform the specific uh, uh, operation that I might uh, want to do. Okay, tag invoke is uh, an attempt to try and uh, take uh, CPOs. Uh, to the next level and basically try to write uh, one canonical recipe that uh, anyone can uh, maybe use. And uh, uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, something really cool. You, you're, you're, you should look uh, this uh, up in YouTube. There are nice uh, talks uh, where you can learn more about that. Okay, um, by the way, uh, there's, I understand there's sometimes a confusion about uh, another uh, term which is called nibloids. Nibloids are also uh, objects uh, exist uh, and have uh, operator uh, parents parents and are also uh, uh, exist in order to uh, avoid some uh, uh, overload resolution uh, intricacies around the argument dependent lookup. Uh, they're not uh, strictly not exactly customization points, but they also uh, were created to deal with the same uh, issues. So if if you if there are people who confuse uh, between the terms, others don't. I don't think it really uh, matters. But many times, if you hear people talk about nibloids you can now know that uh, this is what they mean. Okay, um, moving on. So, and uh, uh, one uh, uh, last application-guided approach that I want to uh, talk about is something that is not uh, yet uh, uh, in the language, but it's inside the, the uh, proposal for uh, C++23. It was created uh, while designing uh, C++23 executors. And these are basically um, uh, two uh, uh, STL functions called the require and prefer, okay? Or basically, an application can uh, uh, try to uh, take an executor, for example, or take any library object and ask and require or prefer some uh, feature or some functionality, okay? The library implementer, in this case, uh, the, the executor's uh, proposal implementers, they've, dis they've uh, uh, decided on some vocabulary, on some uh, amount of uh, uh, attributes, traits or features uh, that the uh, executors can uh, uh, implement if they want. And uh, 
uh, they require or prefer a, a mechanism is a way to tell the, an executor, I, I want you to uh, go and enable this feature or another feature, et cetera. Usually, uh, these will uh, uh, not compile in case the specific executor that we're running with does not support that specific uh, um, vocabulary uh, attribute. And if it, uh, if it does compile, then the return value will be a different executor, which basically is like the, the initial one, but with uh, the extra uh, feature, the extra functionality. And uh, you should uh, go and maybe look at uh, the talk uh, by, uh, I believe, David Holman and Eric Nibbler um, about uh, uh, this uh, feature and this mechanism, uh, which uh, they believe has made the executor's proposal much cleaner, much nicer, much easier to uh, be uh, generic and to support many, many types of, uh, uh, of, of executors with many, many types of applications in a nice and clean way. So again, if you think you want to write a library with many different implementations and you don't know exactly what uh, your application might want, but you can uh, you know, put some vocabulary around it, put some types around it. Maybe you can look at uh, this uh, uh, mechanism. It might make sense for you, okay? And uh, similar to uh, um, other examples before, uh, this uh, require and prefer mechanism is something that can be um, used uh, differently in different call sites. So if I have maybe the same algorithm that I want to run with the same executor, but in one place in my code, I want to do it uh, uh, in a blocking mode. In, a, in another uh, scenario, I want to run it in a non-blocking mode. I can basically do it. There's, uh, there's no tight coupling between the application type, the library type, and the actual behavior. Okay, so that's, uh, um, that's uh, behavior properties. And uh, here's a short uh, uh, a summary of the different uh, mechanisms that I've uh, talked about so far. This is a rather uh, large uh, uh, table with uh, a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, with a lot of different, uh, um, you know, uh, categories and and and, uh, and 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 attributes. I won't go over each and every cell. We basically tried to to talk about it before, but maybe you can use this uh, to try and think about the things. We can see that uh, uh, the first three uh, mechanisms are relatively similar in nature. Uh, the library can choose whether to enable or disable various uh, functionalities or just choose from a, a few. Um, there's no way uh, in, with these mechanisms to inject user code into the library. And uh, some of these mechanisms are, are simpler than, than others. Um, the, the last uh, four are more uh, application driven. And in some cases, uh, um, it can be uh, customized at the call sites. In others, they are not. Um, with the policy-based design, I put the simplicity as a yes with an asterisk, because as I mentioned, it is considered very simple and very uh, easy for a function uh, algorithm, for functions and algorithms, and a little less so in case of uh, classes or data structures. Uh, I guess uh, this can be maybe a good time to also uh, stop and see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions. I see there's a comment. Uh, from Jeff Garland that uh, paper 1393 was, uh, uh, was eventually not accepted. I'm not sure if that's uh, uh, specifically the SDD uh, uh, prefer and require, but uh, maybe that is it, maybe not. Please, uh, anything that's not in the standard, obviously is still up for discussion. Um, so that's uh, the basic uh, uh, summary of uh, overall resolution and how we uh, um, and how it's uh, a, and the different uh, mechanisms um, and customizations and, and how we can use them. And when you write your library, you can basically choose, pick and choose between the different alternatives. And this is, this is just the, the main uh, uh, ways and main thoughts of, about them. There are also uh, advanced uh, uh, ways to, to use them or to tweak those uh, things. Um, so uh, um, uh, I try to write down a few like, advanced examples, uh, advanced ways to use the mechanisms. So for requires and, and enable if, uh, where we know that uh, choosing from a few alternatives is generally done by the library, uh, there are ways that the library can be implemented and pass a little bit of that uh, uh, responsibility towards the application, okay? The, the basic way that uh, I can recommend to do uh, that is uh, through a mechanism that uh, can be called a warrant or an escape patch, which is basically, again, to try and uh, put in some, uh, some predicate, which, uh, uh, our uh, enable if or requires clauses uh, also uh, consults with. And that predicate can be always 
either always true or always false, but they allow the application to uh, specialize it, override it, and by that way interfere or uh, try to affect uh, the exact uh, uh, choice that uh, will, be, will be made uh, when, when matching an application class with the library uh, algorithm. Okay. Uh, similarly, for a tag dispatch, um, there, um, yeah, th there are ways to uh, to expose uh, um, uh, inside the tag dispatch. Not not just. Mm, let me. Yeah, as you mentioned, th there are ways to uh, uh, to let the uh, the caller um, basically try to add a few more uh, uh, items to uh, the tag dispatch. Uh, a few more uh, uh, categories to the uh, uh, types of categories that uh, the library uh, defined. There are ways to maybe, uh, as we mentioned, put the uh, category itself as a, another argument to the function with a default uh, value. And that way, um, whoever uses tag dispatch can have a little bit more flexibility compared to, for example, the way that STL does it. Uh, with policy-based design, again, we can uh, uh, have... Uh, the policy itself, uh, and not just, uh, um, I guess, inject code with uh, maybe like an operator parent parent, but also just uh, have some tags. Uh, the policy can just be some enum or some uh, uh, or some uh, uh, boolean, and uh, that way um, the library can implement several uh, uh, several implementations for a function, and uh, the, the caller policy will not inject code, but just uh, uh, choose uh, using an enum which implementation they might want to use, okay? Uh, CPOs uh, can basically, uh, um, you know, because uh, there, there is code injection there, because uh, um, the user uh, code can run uh, uh, during the uh, library execution, uh, they can basically uh, um, uh, do perform runtime choices uh, around uh, the way that uh, the library uh, works. So for example, I can, uh, write uh, several implementations and uh, have a customization uh, uh, point where the, the application just uh, needs to return an enum or again, return a Boolean at runtime. And uh, my library will call the customization point, not in order to really tell me uh, what, uh, how to perform or, or what code to run, just give me an enum and based on that enum, the library can choose between several alternatives. Okay, so these are advanced uses of uh, those uh, same mechanisms. And again, if you like, you can uh, use them as well. Okay, so uh, we're about uh, an hour into the talk. We're done with the second part as well. Uh, let's go and see if there are any comments or questions. I think we're good. Um, yeah, please uh, feel free to, uh, to write comments, feel free to, to interact. I'm really happy to, uh, you know, to, to to learn and to and to hear what you think about these things, and uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, okay, so now uh, last uh, point about uh, uh, not just uh, syntax but about uh, semantics. Okay, so uh, uh, to to start us off, I want to say that semantics are tricky. Okay, and to uh, try to prove my point, here are a couple of examples inside C++, inside SDL uh, itself, where uh, semantics were, uh, I think, uh, um, you know were done and designed uh, in, in a way that, uh, in hindsight, was less than, uh, than optimal. And uh, some, in some of these cases, we're actually still even paying for those things uh, today. I don't know if you, uh, uh, when you read those two bullets, uh, things immediately pop into your head and you understand what it is, but uh, no, no worries, I'll uh, try and uh, tell you a little bit about them now. So first of all is, is Trivia copyable V for a pair of two ints, okay? So a pair of two ints, probably everyone knows, is something that uh, looks, very, very similar to a struct with two integers, very, very similar. And the is trivially copyable V is a, a type trait in the STL standard that tries to tell us, does this uh, uh, object, uh, is this object something that uh, can be trivially copied? Okay, and the uh, semantics of trivially copying something basically says that instead of performing a copy construction, uh, I can just do a mem copy. Okay, so things that are trivially copyable uh, can, uh, it's allowed the compiler to just uh, perform mem copy in order to uh, create copies of them. And the uh, STD pair of two ints, if we look at its uh, implementation across the STLs, in terms of uh, semantics, they are all implemented in ways where mem copy is good enough to copy them. Okay, and still, is trivially a copyable V for STD pair of int, int is unfortunately false. Okay, and because it's false, it has a, a 
performance costs on a, a lot of our uh, a lot of libraries, a lot of, a lot of things in the code base. Um, and uh, the basic reason for that has actually to do with the relationship between syntax and the semantics. Okay, so the semantics of trivially copyable V is, has to do with is it okay to just mem copy something? But the syntax requirements of trivially copyable V is something that's uh, more tricky. It has to do with uh, the, does with whether a class has uh, specific implementations or non-default implementations for copy constructors, for assignment operators, etc. And uh, for uh, historical reasons, std pair in the C plus ninety eight did have a non-trivial assignment operator. Uh, it was basically basically because std pair is a template, and they wanted it uh, to also work uh, nicely uh, with uh, reference objects and uh, to be able to uh, do uh, uh, to work with pairs of references to ints, for example, and not to ints themselves. And uh, when C ninety eight was implemented, they didn't think of good mechanisms uh, such as enable if etc. to uh, hide or eliminate uh, those. Uh, uh, assignment operators for each and every type of uh, template. And for that reason, uh, uh, STD pair syntactically uh, is not trivially copyable. And for that, and the compiler makes it non trivially copyable. And it has a uh, performance impacts on many data structures that uh, use as pairs, like key values, et cetera. And it's a shame. And uh, unfortunately, there is no real good uh, or easy way to fix it because uh, uh, it's trivially copyable actually is, is a trade that uh, leaks into the ABI, okay? Um, the compiler itself uh, has rules around, uh, uh, around uh, how to pass uh, objects around uh, into functions and out of functions, and, these really, and uh, the, those uh, syntactic uh, constraints uh, you know, are definitely uh, 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 part of it. So if uh, we go ahead and change uh, STD pair syntactically to be trivially copyable, it, it's an ABI break. So right now the standard chose not to do it. Okay. Um, a second example is uh, the complexity of uh, the size uh, member function for STD list. Okay. The size member function of STD list is actually a break that was decided to, to be done. Okay. Until C11, it was okay for uh, STL implementations to either uh, have a linear time uh, size uh, method or constant time size method. And since C++21, uh, 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 there was a decision to change uh, the this, this semantic requirements uh, for a, a size and, uh, and uh, uh, make it so that it has to be a, a constant. Okay? And, and making a, uh, an STD list that, is, uh, that has linear time uh, complexity for size uh, suddenly, in a new version, uh, allow uh, performance in constant time usually means that the STD list object needs to be larger. It usually means that it's, it's uh, an ABI break. And for that reason, uh, it's tricky. Still, uh, the C++ uh, uh, committee decided to go for it, and they did make this change in C++11. Unfortunately, because of the break, it took a very long time for many, many common distributions to, to really adopt it. There were uh, various uh, Linux distributions that uh, even until uh, quite recently uh, shipped out the default uh, uh, STL library, which had the linear time uh, size uh, uh, function, even when you try to, uh, you know, to compile it for C++11 and even uh, further, you had to choose a specific uh, uh, define uh, preprocessor statement to uh, opt in or to switch to the conformant uh, uh, version. So again, very, very tricky. And uh, this is, uh, again, a, a semantics only uh, thing. And what do I mean by uh, saying that semantic only thing? That has to do with uh, uh, like users or, or users of uh, this uh, uh, container called the STD list. Um, because uh, for example, uh, in C20, there's a concept called size range. Okay, and the size range is uh, basically something that uh, syntactically is a range, and also using the requires uh, expression has a, a function called the uh, size, or you can call sorry, you can call std uh, ranges colon colon size for uh, uh, for that uh, range. Okay, and std colon colon size by the way is a customization point object, and uh, basically what we can see here is that uh, syntactically. Uh, STD list should uh, is a sized range, similarly for most of the other uh, STL uh, containers. And in C++, since C11, it's obviously uh, good and fine. If you go and read the, the, the fine print 
around uh, this concept, you see that these are the uh, syntactic requirements, but there is also a semantic requirement. Okay, the semantic requirement is that uh, 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 this uh, ranges colon colon size uh, operation has to run in constant time. Okay, and if it uh, doesn't run in constant time, uh, then this turns into undefined behavior, as we said. It will be syntactically correct, but it does, will not meet the semantic requirements. And for that reason, uh, uh, in order to uh, avoid the, uh, you know, causing applications to, you know, realm into undefined behavior territory, um, the STL went ahead and added an escape hatch, okay? So inside STL 0 to 20, there's a constant context of Boolean called disable size range, okay? It's equals to false, okay? The, there's no place in the STL that uh, converts it into true, but it lets a, any application that wants, it has its own range to uh, go in the, and, and specialize this and say, for my range, even though range is colon colon size works, I would like to opt out. I would like to uh, get an, an, an escape hatch and, uh, uh, and I would like, to, uh, um, uh, would like to, to opt out of this uh, uh, size range concept, okay? This is, I think, very, very tricky and very, very uh, confusing because when you just look at the concept declaration itself, you don't see any mention of disabled size range and of this uh, escape hatch, but still it exists and still uh, it's a way that uh, uh, allows uh, applications to use uh, C++20 safely and use uh, size ranges safely if they have uh, objects that implement size and uh, are not uh, conforming to the semantic constant time requirement. Okay, um, I see that uh, in the Discord page, there's some, yeah, some, uh, out, GCC uh, output, but um, don't think it's really relevant for all of us. Uh, okay, so uh, moving on with uh, escape patches, I want to say that uh, um, this uh, uh, example is uh, what I would call uh, a negative escape patch, like something that the, the library uh, uh, should usually, uh, uh, can usually work in one way, and uh, uh, I let uh, the applications uh, opt out, okay? If there are other places where one might uh, go for a positive uh, escape patch or what uh, I think uh, Arthur O'Dwyer and other calls warrants, okay? A warrant is a, is, uh, uh, a similar thing, but uh, just on the other way around, where the assumption of the library is that some uh, functionality or some capability does not exist for any application uh, object unless the application goes and specializes or overrides it uh, and uh, converts it back into true and just opts in to some functionality. Okay, there's a, a really interesting uh, topic uh, to anyone who's inside, who's interested with the various uh, is trivially uh, type traits, like is trivially copyable, is trivially constructible, destructible, etc. cetera. Um, there's a, a proposal for a very important and nice uh, uh, trait called uh, is trivially relocatable, which can give a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, performance uh, improvements to a lot of to, to our code. Uh, the, the only thing is that it's very hard to uh, uh, syntactically look at the class and, and decide whether it's uh, uh, trivially relocatable or not. And one way to work around it is by using warrants, by uh, forcing uh, uh, whoever writes a library object uh, to basically opt in and say, hey, I know that uh, this uh, type is uh, trivially relocatable. If you uh, listen to many experts like uh, Arthur Dwyer and others, uh, they, they say and they, they correctly say that warrants are risky, okay? If an uh, application uh, chooses to opt in to a warrant uh, without actually uh, meeting the semantic requirements, it, it, can, it can lead them into a path of a lot of uh, hardships and problems. I would argue that uh, these types of hardships are uh, quite common in C++. Those are what we usually call food guns. Uh, so I think uh, they should usually be fine. And here we see a type of like a negative uh, a warrant that is used inside the STL. And here's another example, by the way, uh, for uh, such an escape patch, which is, uh, or this is actually a warrant, uh, which is called the uh, enable uh, borrowed range. Uh, enable borrowed range, again, it's a Boolean um, that uh, wants to define or, or want to help the library know whether a specific range that uh, the library will work with is borrowed or not borrowed. The borrowed uh, has to do with uh, uh, whether um, you know, the, you know, the elements inside the range 
uh, are owned or not owned by uh, the range itself, etc. I won't go into uh, details about it. You can look at lectures uh, about uh, the ranges library. But again, we can see that uh, by default, we assume uh, ranges are not borrowed. And uh, uh, anyone who implements a new range and it is borrowed is expected to go and uh, specialize uh, this uh, Boolean to be true, to basically tell the STL, tell the ranges library that this specific new range is actually a borrowed range. Okay, so this is another uh, example of this uh, concept. Here, we see that uh, the STL took a, what I think is a good step forward and put this uh, Boolean expression as part of the actual concept declaration. Okay, so here we can actually see uh, if we look at the header files, if we look, if we'll, we look at the uh, uh, compilation errors, for example, uh, this uh, usage of this uh, uh, warrant. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's really good because it's more verbose and it uh, helps people who have uh, issues with it know what they might be doing wrong or which uh, Boolean they might uh, want to uh, specialize, etc. This is unlike uh, the first case where there is no mention of uh, uh, the Boolean inside the, uh, the concept itself. I, I have to say that I don't really know why uh, the definition of the concept side range doesn't include uh, this uh, Boolean inside uh, its definition. Um, and if you have ideas, I'll be happy to hear. Um, and uh, now let's look at another uh, example that has to do with the semantics, which I might uh, want to call a cheaply copyable T. Okay, and this is uh, an excerpt from uh, Herb Sutter's talk uh, from the last uh, CPPCon, where he talks about uh, passing arguments uh, into uh, functions. Passing arguments is uh, you know, one of the uh, things that are hardest uh, for newbies to C++ to, to learn and understand all the different uh, details. And uh, in, in this talk, uh, or in this uh, section, we'll see how uh, uh, Herb uh, tells us about the uh, good logic for template functions to handle their input uh, arguments. So let's see what he has to say. But now let's look at templates. Let's go back to a simpler version of the example with just one in parameter, but of a templated type. Turns out you have to write this nest of things. Basically, you're saying, if I should pass by value, so I should pass by value if it's trivially copyable and the size is less than something. Less OK. So uh, this is you know, very, very small text. I don't expect you to read uh, all of it. You are very welcome to listen to Herb's entire talk. It's really, really interesting. But the gist of it is that uh, um, Herb tries to write, you know, to show us uh, some implementation of uh, a template function that uh, wants to accept an argument, which is a template type. And uh, in some cases, it wants uh, the argument uh, to be passed by value. In other cases, it wants to be passed by const reference. And we can see that uh, uh, this uh, code, the example that you is written, is a C++ 20 code. It has requires clauses around the different uh, implementations. We, get, we see that it has uh, three implementations for this uh, function, one for uh, uh, pass by value, another for const reference, and the third for uh, uh, R value reference. And uh, one thing that uh, really stood out to me is that uh, this is C++20 code. It has a uh, requires clauses. It uses all the nice things in C++20. And still, when uh, Herb uh, went in, in this example and uh, defined uh, this uh, new Boolean that he wants, uh, the new predicate uh, that he wants to use, he calls it uh, um, should pass by value. He chose some rule. The rule isn't really important. He chose, uh, for example, is trivial and copyable and size of uh, T is less than eight. But he decided to uh, put this, uh, uh, value inside a context per bool and not inside a concept. Okay, so context per bool is a predicate on type. Concept is also a predicate on type. Why did uh, Herb choose uh, not to use a concept? It's C plus twenty. And uh, when I first saw it, it really puzzled me. I didn't really think of, uh, didn't really uh, have a good uh, good idea about it. Obviously, this isn't just a small part of his talk. He might have just uh, didn't really think about it uh, uh, too much. He might, uh, you know, I didn't ask him. I, believe uh, he's not uh, in the audience, uh, but uh, maybe we can ask him uh, sometime. Uh, but uh, when I try to think about it, I, I think maybe uh, I can think of a reason. And the reason is exactly what we talked about before, escape patches, okay, and specialization. If uh, a library uh, uses uh, this mechanism of context per bool, it has uh, this default uh, uh, choice. You should pass by value V, will be uh, uh, de by default uh, uh, chosen uh, through this mechanism, but uh, whoever uh, has its own type, which might be uh, a little uh, uh, larger than, uh, than seven bytes, 
or maybe uh, non-trivially copyable, but still uh, uh, relatively easily copyable. Um, uh, whoever wants uh, with this uh, type of code could uh, specialize this uh, uh, Boolean for their own type and specialize it either to uh, true if their default rule says false, specialize it to false if the default rule says true. This is very flexible. Okay, this is sort of an escape patch. Okay, and it would not have been possible if uh, uh, one would choose to use concepts. So this is again something that uh, uh, we might want to consider when we define our own concepts. Um, will will uh, we do? We want to let uh, the application override our uh, rules and uh, basically bypass uh, the, the default uh, choices that uh, the library wants to make for them. Okay, so this is uh, basically it, and. Uh, um, you know, a little, uh, a few more uh, uh, of these uh, semantic uh, pitfalls and tricks. I just, uh, um, is uh, an, an example that I, you might uh, find interesting is a concept uh, inside C20 uh, called equivalence relation. What's an equivalence relation? It's something that is, uh, it's a relation. It's a, basically a function uh, um, between uh, two uh, types of objects or two objects that uh, uh, can uh, return a Boolean, okay? And, uh, and, we can, and we can, if you, people who uh, maybe remember a little bit about uh, algebra, uh, remember that the equivalence relation is uh, a relation that uh, meets uh, these uh, three semantic requirements, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. There are other uh, relations like uh, uh, weakly ordered uh, uh, relations or, or strongly ordered relations, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, the difference between relation and equivalence relation is purely semantic. Yeah, and we can see it right here inside the, uh, the code, okay? Uh, um, the concept equivalence relation is just equal syntactically to, to a relation. There is no way that a compiler can help us uh, basically uh, choose among those two things, okay? If I have a function and I want to constrain it only for equivalence relations, Okay, I can write that it requires an equivalence relation. I can use the required clause with an equivalence relation. But if the application goes and uh, passes on or uh, uh, another relation, like a, a weakly ordered relation or something like that, then uh, there is no way currently for the compiler to tell to be smart about it and say, "Hey, this is wrong. This is uh, this is not uh, uh, this is not, was not the way that the library intended for these uh, things to work." Okay, there is no way, good way uh, for the uh, compiler to help us when we define our concepts in this way. And look, obviously, um, the compiler will also not be able to choose among those two. But that's not a, a usually a big issue. I think it would be very strange for a library to implement two overloads one of them for an equivalence relation and the other for uh, like a, an ordering relation. But it should be quite common to just have you know, an, an on-off uh, requires clause to say this uh, uh, algorithm requires uh, an equivalence relation and the compiler will not help us if we pass in something else, which is quite a shame. And when I uh, looked at it and read about it and thought about escape patches, I was also a little bit puzzled. I thought, why didn't they add some sort of an escape patch? Why didn't them... Uh, they just add the ability uh, for someone to opt in or opt out. If uh, someone writes their own relation and they know that it's an equivalence relation, why not force them to, or at least uh, let them uh, um, basically tag it? Why not let them uh, opt in and say, this, my, this relation is actually an equivalence relation and this other relation is actually not an equivalence relation and uh, uh, make the, the library itself uh, use those uh, uh, hints or use those uh, escape patches or what I might call uh, uh, semantic sugaring um, as a way to, to help the user not pass incorrect uh, objects into the library in the way that it expects them. Okay, so uh, this is something that I think uh, uh, is worth considering. And uh, after I uh, uh, you know, thought about it and talked about it with a few people, uh, an interesting comment that I received was that uh, it might be... Uh, a nice idea to uh, to add some uh, uh, some extra uh, booleans or some extra operations with the uh, escape patches uh, to uh, something like an equivalence relation. Uh, in I guess in theory, but in practice it can be really uh, problematic because many times uh, these relations are not really classes the application uh, uh, the application writes, but it's actually lambda expressions. Okay, lambda objects that accepts uh, two arguments and uh, return a boolean are also syntactically relations. And for a lambda, it's not really clear uh, how one would opt in or opt out uh, to uh, some specific Boolean. And uh, I thought about it a little bit more and it, it 
sort of like made sense to me. Um, but at some point, I uh, figured that uh, there might be a way uh, to work around that. It might be a way to add semantic sugar even to lambdas, to take uh, something that syntactically looks one way and attach some semantics to it. Okay, so this is a, an example of something that someone might want to use. So, so for example, one in a, one library might uh, decide to define a concept that maybe um, uh, um, can, can describe code that is critical. Okay, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe critical code is something that has been audited. So it has maybe an, uh, an auditor and audit data um, functionality or maybe some other things, or it, maybe it's just, uh, it's just, maybe it's just a tag, just saying that uh, uh, I want to attach it only to uh, pieces of code that I know uh, that have been uh, audited in some way. And I would like uh, maybe uh, 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 run with privileges to be a library function that it only works for uh, operations that are critical code, okay? This, this is a way to, instead of a required clause, to constrain my function only to, to critical code. And uh, uh, how would one uh, go and use this mechanism uh, for Lambda objects? So uh, is it possible to write something like a mark critical, like, like sort of like a function or something that I can put my uh, Lambda inside it and say, yeah, I know that this is, uh, uh, this is critical code, Okay, if I put it here, then later uh, someone who looks at my code base can just use a grep to find all those uh, uh, critical pieces of code and maybe uh, audit them, etc. Okay, and uh, if you want, if you were to write such a um, mark critical mechanism, you can sprinkle it around the code and make sure that you can easily find all those lambda expressions that are more critical than others. Similarly, we can mark something as equivalence, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, that's uh, the basic. Uh, uh, idea um, and how one how might one uh, go and implement this uh, mark critical um, uh, functionality? Okay, so the basic idea that I had, I'm sure that maybe you will also have uh, other ideas as well, um, is to use uh, some trick that I've seen before um, with a class called the overloaded. Okay, which basically uh, has to do with the fact that uh, uh, one can derive from a lambda objects, okay? So uh, in, th in this code section, mark critical is a template uh, that's templated on type T. And this T can also be a lambda object. I derive from it, this is my base class. Uh, and it also derives in this case from the critical code tag. There are other ways to do it, but this is the way I chose to do it uh, uh, in, in here. And uh, using the using operator, and sometimes I need the deduction guide, depending on the, uh, how conformant my, my uh, compiler is, um, I can basically um, wrap a uh, Lambda object uh, with another object uh, which uh, has another uh, base class in this example or, or has some other, is a little different. And uh, this critical code tag is, uh, is just a tag type and, uh, and I can uh, uh, define uh, the, the critical code uh, uh, V uh, predicate as something that is false for every type but it's true for anything that is derived from critical code tag, okay? And uh, using this mechanism, I can basically, I have this, uh, I have my uh, predicate that is false for every lambda, for every callable object, it can be true for anything that derives from critical code tag, either a lambda or not, mark critical will wrap lambda and make it a critical code. And my concept will basically be equal uh, to this uh, uh, object, and this will allow people to just opt in or opt out to semantic uh, uh, requirements, which is what I call uh, semantic sugar. I think it's a nice uh, trick. So uh, we have uh, only a few minutes left, so uh, let's uh, summarize things. So first and foremost, foremost concepts are great. Uh, we've seen uh, many uh, mechanisms that existed in the past for libraries to interact with uh, applications. The concepts uh, are a very good replacement uh, for many of the use cases. They offer very good uh, readability, very good uh, compile time performance, very good error messages. Uh, when you think of concepts, when you think of uh, writing libraries, uh, also uh, keep in mind that the requires does not uh, require you to use concepts. What I'm meaning is that the language now has requires expressions. The language now has requires clauses, and we can use them even without concepts per se. We can use a requires clause with any other predicate that we like. We can use requires expressions to put the, uh, uh, you know, to create Boolean expressions, not just in concepts. And uh, you know, when you think about the, uh, uh, you know, writing C++ 20 code, there are several situations where I think you might uh, want to use requires even without specifically working with concepts. Um, 
Uh, a few tips uh, for library writers, uh, from my perspective, is try to give your users power. Okay, power sometimes uh, is also power to, mis to misbehave, but still I think it's uh, uh, that's it's a common C++ uh, way to work. So I would uh, recommend to consider adding uh, escape patches or warrants to your uh, libraries. Uh, consider method or ways in which uh, uh, the applications can do call site customizations and uh, uh, have different. Uh, um, very engines of your library uh, be uh, activated and different uh, call sites, even if the application classes are the same. And um, you know, my two cents uh, towards the C++ standards or, or things that I do not uh, fully understand uh, are wondering about and think maybe you can uh, also help with is uh, about the uh, concept, concept specialization, okay? The fact that concepts themselves cannot be specialized. Um, I'm not really sure uh, why that is, why that is the only thing that cannot be specialized. As we mentioned, there's a way to work around it. If the, um, if the library chose to uh, write a concept in a specific manner, but there are concepts that uh, are written in other ways and cannot be uh, uh, specialized, cannot be uh, bypassed. Uh, similarly, for type traits, um, you know, the type traits are, semantically, it's okay to, uh, um, sorry, syntactically, it's okay to uh, uh, do specialization on regular type traits from C++ 98 and on, but actually the C++ standard says that the C++ standard uh, type traits, it's not allowed to specialize them. If you go and try to specialize them, it is undefined behavior. So it's, it's illegal uh, for me to go and uh, try to specialize uh, is trivially copyable for a uh, std pair of int int and say that it's true because I know it's true and try to have the compiler just uh, do it and deal with the ABI repercussions and deal with the, the performance repercussions, etc. It's just uh, undefined behavior. And I think maybe um, even the language can uh, consider giving power to users. Um, Okay, so this is uh, basically my talk. We have just about uh, four minutes left. I'd like to thank you all. This was really exciting for me. I hope you had a good time and uh, maybe uh, picked up uh, an interesting point or two. Uh, let's go to the chat. And you can see that, uh, uh, yes, so uh, thank you, uh, Phil and everyone for uh, the nice warm talks. Um, and uh, uh, as, as Phil mentions, uh, uh, this is not the only uh, talk about concepts uh, uh, from uh, from in this conference, and obviously there are talks in other conferences. I'm really, really uh, I think that if uh, you know what you heard here uh, was interesting, go and listen to the other talks. I'm sure that there's a lot more to learn. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, any more uh, questions or comments? Thank you, everyone. I, I will go and uh, uh, see you in the uh, virtual space uh, right after the talk ends. If you want to uh, talk, uh, you know, uh, a little more discreetly, a little more one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the uh, video and all, I'll be happy uh, uh, to hear you and see you. Um, if there are no more questions, then uh, really, thank you. Thank you very much.